it's, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, this evening's event, which is really uh, linked with the launch of uh, the first volume of the, the Library of Arabic Literature, which is um, a research project, in fact, um, funded by a grant of the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. Uh, last week, internally within NYU Abu Dhabi, we actually were delighted to be able to launch the first volume uh, in the series. Um, so we were able to show our, our, our community, but we're very pleased to be able to show the larger community in Abu Dhabi, the, the sort of branding of our, of our enterprise, which is this, the Library of Arabic Lit Literature, Al Maktab Al Arabiya, obviously associated with um, NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, of which it is a special imprint. Um, so if you see this logo, I want to really sort of imprint it in your minds so that you, sort of, you gravitate towards it and buy the books. Um, this is the, uh, just a, a photograph of the first volume, which is in fact an anthology, uh, classical Arabic literature, a library of Arabic literature anthology, uh, selected and translated by Khertian van Gelder, who was who's just retired as the Laudian Professor of Arabic at Oxford. And the book does exist physically here. I mean, I'm going to make this book available for people to flick through after our discussion. Um, it should be available in Magrudi's uh, uh, quite soon. And it's, it's not, in fact, the real McCoy of, of our series in the sense that it's an anthology um, that, of sele selections of translations of, from Arabic literature dating from the uh, pre-Islamic period right through to the 18th century, uh, both prose and poetry. Um, the, the books, the real McCoy, that we are um, producing in the next five years are actually parallel text editions and translations of some of uh, the key works of Arabic literature, as many as possible. The idea is, in the first five years, to produce about 35 volumes, perhaps that, that uh, equals 35 works. Some of the works we're, we're working on, in fact, will end up being produced in multi-volume, uh, in, in several volumes. Uh, so um, this is just a, a, gives you an idea of that, the parallel text um, format of the, of the works. Now, I actually passed over a couple of images. This is, each of the volumes has a, a, a calligraphic signature. This one says Al-Manthur um, And I'm very pleased to show you these two in particular, because obviously that says Asaq al-Asaq, leg over leg, which is the title of Ahmed Faris al shidyaks very famous 19th century, uh, rather maverick, eccentric novel. This says uh, Abu al-A'la al mari Now the reason I show you these two calligraphic signatures is simply, is partly because uh, we're very pleased that the, the calligrapher who's who's done these, produced these, is a local calligrapher. And we're very keen to work with locals in our venture. And secondly, these two works uh, will be appearing very soon. Um, sorry. Asak al-Asak is being translated by the, uh, the award-winning trans translator, Humphrey Davis, who has several times, I think, won the Banipal Prize. Uh, he's he's, he's well-known for his translations, in particular of Elias Khoury. Um, now, the re <laughs> what I really want to stress is the fact that when people have um, asked us about this project and have asked us what are the, some of the first works you're translating, we said, well, Asaq al-Asaq and Abu al-Ala al-Ma'ari's Risalat al-Ghufran, which is being translated uh, by Khertian van Gelder, the author of the anthology, in collaboration with a very distinguished German scholar called Gregor Schuler. Now, the point about these two books that I want to make and, um, is, is that people say, but how can you possibly translate them? They're untranslatable. They are extremely difficult works to, tr to translate because of their philological richness. Um, but we've sent, uh, set ourselves uh, the challenge to do that in order to really to, to aim high right from the start. And it seems to be working. Yeah, Humphrey Davis has, has actually turned in half of his manuscript, and it's actually a, it's a fabulous piece of work. And I'm sure you all know the significance of that work in literary, Arabic literary history. The problem with Asaq al-Asaq is everyone knows its importance in the Nahda as a, as a kind of a work that's at the cusp of the modern 
of the pre-modern and the modern period. But no one reads it because it's so difficult. But our aim is to make it readable to both the English uh, uh, reader, the Anglophone reader, and in, in fact help the, the Arabophone reader. Um, so I won't say anything more about the 35 books that we are translating. I, I need to press on, really. Uh, this evening we're going to... Well, one of the key things about the Library of Arabic Literature is that the editorial board meets twice a year uh, for a day and a half. And then what we, one of the, what we really want to stress is that we're making these books available for public discussion. We're not just sort of publishing them for ourselves. So, um, and the other thing related to this is, is that, um, what it relates to this evening, is that we're not just doing the works that are, 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 are standard references in, the, uh, literary, in Arabic literary history. We're trying to help our audience, our readership, but discover some, some of the great treasures of, of Arabic literature, which are less well known. And I think that is certainly the case of uh, this evening's text, the text we're going to discuss this evening. Uh, Nisa al Khulafa by Ibn Sa'i, about which a couple of my, my colleagues are going to say more in a minute. So I want to stress the fact that uh, the, the editorial board collaborates uh, among itself um, and wants to really to collaborate with the, with the public in, 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 uh, and engage in um, uh, really animated and um, searching discussions about these texts, which we, we're really uh, endeavoring to, to discover and rediscover together. So, um, without more ado, I'll just, I'll just show you this image. And the, the significance of this image is that we're a, a translation series. We're translating uh, uh, these, these texts from pre-modern pre -modern Arabic literature. But we are also editing the texts, and, and that's a, a really uh, key uh, and essential aspect of what we're doing. And, and, uh, um, as we see our mission. Um, I think that's something we'll talk about in, in, the, in the subsequent discussion. So this, this photograph, image of a, of a manuscript, in fact, is uh, from the Unicum manuscript of the work we're going to talk about this evening. It, the significance is simply to tell you that in preparing the text uh, for the Library of Arabic Literature, we're going, we are really setting uh, quite strict editorial standards of reviewing uh, all uh, available uh, published editions, both critical and non-critical, but also where necessary, and, that's, and it seems always to be necessary, of going back to the most important manuscripts of any, of any particular work, of, of the work in question. It's easy when the work is a, is a unicum, and this one happens to be a particularly beautiful one. Now, I'm not going to say anything more other than, again, repeat uh, welcome, and I hope uh, we have a really fruitful discussion this evening. I'm sure we will. Uh, to uh, lead us through this discussion, uh, I'm very pleased and delighted to introduce one of my, my great friends and, and colleagues, Professor Shokat Turawa. I'm trying to set up his... Uh, is it this one, Shokat? Yes. 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 So I'm very, very pleased to, intro to introduce to you uh, Professor Shokat Turawa, who's one of the Executive, two executive editors of the Library of Arabic Literature. Um, he's going to say a, a word or two more about our project and, and in fact, about this evening's proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this evening's presentation and, and panel discussion. The evening will be decide, uh, divided into two parts. Uh, the first is uh, Philip, followed by me, followed by another one of our editorial board members, speaking with you, and then we will, uh, I will invite uh, the uh, entire editorial team to the stage and we'll have a conversation with you. There are some things that we wanted to tell you about first, uh, and um, my task, as it were, is to tell you a little bit about collaboration. One of the hallmarks of the Library of Arabic Literature is that we've emphasized collaborative ventures and collaborative work. <clears throat> what does this mean? This means that, by and large, within our field, and I dare say within um, many fields of translation, that is to say, w whether it's French literature or German literature or Arabic literature or Japanese, pretty much anything that you can name, translators work uh, alone. They work as solitary scholars, or they think they do. 
they uh, labor away um, by candlelight or by electric light and uh, produce what they think is going to be a world-class translation. Sometimes it is. But one of the things that we've discovered, and that perhaps when you reflect on it, should have been obvious to those people and to others, is that a work can be made more meaningful, more robust, uh, more, can, can affect people more deeply if a group of people have come together, talked about, thought about what the work is doing in its original language, what the work might do in translation. So it's become part of Library of Arabic Literature practice to encourage that. Uh, a good example is the one that uh, Philip already mentioned, Abu al al Ma'ri's the Risalat al Ghufran, the Epistle of Forgiveness, has long been considered untranslatable, according to Phil. Right? Really, really, that is to say, people have regarded that way. Really, the issue is no one person has taken it on. In the case of the Saq al Saq, we approached Humphrey Davis and said, Are you willing to take this on? And he said, I'll give it a shot. In the case of the Risal al Ghufran, we went to Professor Van Gelder, who had prepared this anthology, and we said, Will you do this? And he said, well, it's a big task, and I may not necessarily be interested in doing the whole thing. And it was by urging him to seek a collaborator, in fact, someone with whom he was already collaborating, and urging them to take on the whole work that we have, or we will have, the full translation of the whole front. So what is different about working together? I mean, by, by all accounts, it's more complicated. Uh, email exchanges, disagreements, and you'll see a little bit of this this, this evening, how we negotiated certain choices and certain selections. But the advantage of it is that a dialogue is created around a particular text. This dialogue we have come to discover is invaluable. That is to say, if you'd come to me or to any one of us five years ago and said, here's a work that we really think needs translating, will you do it? If you managed to convince me to do it, I would almost certainly work on my own. And the work would appear with my name on the cover. Or I should say, you would think that I'd worked on my own. The reality is that none of us ever really works on their own. What we do is we prepare a text, whether it's an article, whether it's a translation, anything, and we show it to our colleagues. The colleagues give us feedback, and if we are good people, we will acknowledge in a small note, either at the bottom of the page or at the end of the article, I'd like to thank Joe Lowry for having gone over this translation, or something of that sort. Occasionally, you'd find in a book, uh, for this particular turn of phrase, I'd like to acknowledge Philip Kennedy, right? or Philip Kennedy brought to my attention, this, this sort of thing. And so the, the gesture, of course, is very kind and it's very correct, but really it still gives the impression that this is the work of one person. And it's not clear to us that anything can ever be the work of one person. This, this afternoon I was having a conversation <coughs> with a group of people, and one of the things that I said was, uh, there's something very arrogant about saying, if I have seen this far, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Because it implies that I have seen far. I mean, it may be that I'm depending on the works of giants, but I'm the one who's seeing far. And really what we've discovered is that we're a whole crowd of people, and we're standing on, no doubt, the giants, and trying to work out what it is we can get from that enterprise and from that work, and take it forward. Now, admittedly, it would be very hard for many of us to sit. In fact, it took some time to work out how we were going to do this. You know, and ideally, in a collaboration, you sit around a table. table virtual table to which Phil has already referred. In fact, this is what we were doing today. So one of, the, one of the other hallmarks of the Library of Arabic Literature is that we not only commission works, communicate with translators, collaborate by getting people to collaborate with each other, but we also have now, since uh, the, the last meeting, planned collaborative translation sessions. So we spent yesterday afternoon and all of today around a table thrashing out a translation. And you're going to get a little bit of a sense of that uh, this evening when we, rep when we try to replicate that by showing you certain texts and so on. In thinking about moving this kind of thing forward, one of the things we noticed is that when you typically produce a translation, not only do you not collaborate with anyone, at least overtly or, or um, in any truly collaborative way, but you then just send your translation to a, a press. Right. and the press will have it reviewed, someone, it'll be sent to someone, they'll look at it and they'll decide whether they think it's good or bad. You may get feedback, often you do get feedback, you may or may not incorporate that feedback and your book goes to press. One of the things we decided to do is to insert a stage 
that would require the editor and translator to collaborate with one of us. This person is called a project editor or a volume editor. So for example, Joe Lowry, who's sitting right here in front of me, uh, is producing a translation, edition and translation of the Risala of Shafi'i. It's going to be one of the first books that appears. Now, he happens to be within the board, but we treated him as an outsider. So he's the editor translator. So we had to appoint someone from within the board to work with him, Devin Stewart, who's sitting over there. As the work progressed, Joe Lowry would send material to Devin Stewart, and he would respond and send it back. And they would have conversations, and they would discuss. They arranged to meet. We arranged for them to meet. Even during this meeting, they spent any number of hours going over the material, trying to come to a consensus. Why does one have to come to a consensus? Because ultimately, one has to produce something. Something has to appear. The translator working alone makes that decision alone. The translator working with a project editor or a collaborator or a team makes that decision in conjunction with the team. It becomes a consensus building process. And you'll see some of that tonight as well. We're actually going to kind of display this consensus building. The other thing that collaboration has revealed to us is that we actually don't know as much as we think we know. And that if you bring 10, 9, 8, 2 people together, you get collective knowledge, collective wisdom, collective access, collective training. And it may be, for example, that you have a text that is in literature, and you have a project editor that is in philosophy. And the literary text may have a reference that the translator has very beautifully rendered. And the project editor or the collaborator says, the terminology in this line is philosophical terminology. I see it all the time in my philosophical texts. Maybe we should think about rendering it in a way that will signal this to the English reader. So this is another aspect of, of collaboration. It's bringing to the table the whole range of expertise that has been developed within translators, within scholars, within editors, and so on. The text that we're going to look at today, the Nisa al Khulafa of Ibn Sa'i, which we've loosely translated the women of the caliphs, although we haven't actually had our conversation or argument about whether that's a good translation, Nisa al Khulafa, is one that first came to the attention of a few of us who are on the board because we were part of a, collaborative, a group of scholars who were collaborating together. It started out in graduate school. Many of us have always thought that collaboration is a good idea, and we've often implemented it. This happens to be a subset of us who used to get together and say, let's work on something together, com truly together not only for the purposes of advancing scholarship, but because of suhbah as well, right? We wanted to remain friends and be friends and, and carry forward. So we, we did a book uh, on Arabic autobiography together, which was published, and of which we're very happy, with which we're very happy and of which we're very proud. And as we advanced in our careers and acquired spouses and children and university jobs and pressures in our lives, it became clear to us that we wouldn't be able to collaborate the way we had before. We couldn't take out 10 days and just sit around and shoot the breeze and work out what to do. So we had to find a very focused thing to work on, something ideally short and something very focused. So the very same Joe Lowry suggested to the group, why don't we work on the Nisa al Khulafa? It's short, it's interesting, uh, it's, poetry, it's got poetry, it's got prose, it spans the centuries. It's a unicum, that is to say, it's a manuscript that exists in only one copy. So when we, if we wanted to do anything with it, we just have to get that one copy. We wouldn't have to get, for example, some works exist in 20 manuscripts, and you have to compare them all. So we said, okay, we went, and we went ahead, and we produced a translation. And, and then it languished. And then it so happens that four of us were invited onto this board. Although well, I don't think it's an accident, I think Phil Kennedy, in his um, wisdom, uh, when he was selecting people to work with him, picked the, peop the kinds of people he knew were at least interested in collaborating or open to collaboration. So we said to Phil and others, what about the Nisa al Khulafa? We looked at it 10 years ago. Maybe it'll be a work worth doing. And so this is how it came onto our desk, as it were, because I, I probably don't need to tell you, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of things we could have worked on. And I'll let my colleague Julia Bray tell you more about the text itself. I'll just tell you a little bit more about the collaboration. <coughs> Excuse me. We identified it. We agreed that it's to take it on. The Library of Arabic Literature agreed to take it on. And we thought, well, maybe we should workshop it. Right? Maybe we shouldn't just go back to Joe and Devin and Michael and Shokat and have them produce something. Let's just take what they have in whatever state it's in. And maybe we should get together and workshop it. But before we did that, because we are, after all, an 
intellectual and editing enterprise. We gave it to Julia Bray, who is an expert on this kind of material, and we said, what do you think of the translation so far? What do you think of this as a project? Do you think this is something we should publish? Are we barking up the wrong tree? Are we even competent to do this? Because there, is, there would have been no reason not to subject ourselves to exactly the same standards to which we were subjecting outsiders, as it were. Right? Why, would, why, why would the fact that we selected it mean that we were better able to produce an edition and translation? So she treated the project as an outside project and produced a report, which she then submitted to the board, just as if it was an outside project. And she said, I think this is an exciting text. I think this is a wonderful selection. I think we have to revisit the translation. I think there are some problems. Those problems need to be sorted out. One can't go to press like this. And you have to imagine for a minute here how humbling and correct this is for professors of Arabic literature or of Arabic in the United States worked on this text with the assistance of three others. And when it was subject to the kind of scrutiny that it, that it deserved, it wasn't up to the mark. And this is partly one of the things that the Library of Arabic Literature is trying to do. It's trying to say, it's not that we don't think, to any editor or translator, that you, it's not that we don't think you're competent. It's not we don't, that we think you're not an expert. It's not that we don't think you can come up with the right locution. It's that we think that if you collaborate, if you work with others, if you, in a way, become more humble, be one way of thinking about it, about what you can do with this, it will be a better edition, it will be a better translation. Because we have a responsibility to the people for whom we're producing this. The Library of Arabic Literature isn't some uh, esoteric, erudite series being published in Belgium. Some of you will know which one I'm referring to. Uh, directed at the nine people who can afford the book. And the six of them who actually care about it. The Library of Arabic Literature is an initiative that is the audience of which is the world. Arabic readers, English language readers, and one can only hope that if we're successful, readers of other languages, because hopefully we can model the way that the editing and translating of Arabic texts should be done. Please don't get me wrong, we don't think we have the answers, as you'll find out. We don't think we're doing it better than anyone. There may be others working in solid, solitary scholars who think they're doing a better job, but we know for a fact that our experience with collaboration has produced a better outcome and a better product, and it's made us better scholars. And if we can become better at what we do, it can only benefit the people who are the recipients of that scholarship, of those translations, and so on. So, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to now invite uh, you heard Phil mention the, that Gert Jan van Gelder was the Laudian Professor of Arabic at Oxford, the em Emeritus. The current Laudian Professor of Arabic at Oxford is Julia Bray. She's a member of the editorial board. She's one of the most exacting and wonderful and lovely presences on the board, and I dare say at Oxford. In fact, at Oxford it's pretty obvious. And I'd like her to invite her to give you a little bit of a sense of the, the text, the contexts, and the contents of Ibn Sa'i's Nisa al Khulafa before moving on to the panel. Julia? Well, before I um, uh, start talking more about uh, this work that we are going to uh, discuss together as a panel, I want to mention another essential element of the collaboration which we have now internalized. It seems entirely natural and normal to us, but it didn't at the beginning. When we talked about collaborating, uh, you probably thought that we just meant sending each other emails and correcting each other's typescripts. What we found through a first uh, collaborative session that we held last year is that we need two things in addition to that. First of all, we need somebody who isn't in our branch of the profession, that is to say, who isn't a professional Arabist because we have developed, without at all being aware of it, and on all sorts of levels, a kind of professional blindness. We write translations that are in fact a sort of professional shorthand in what is a jargon. 
And we've become so used to doing that that we don't even know it's a jargon. And until we run it past somebody whose field of literature is different and they point out to us that this is gobbledygook to anybody else, we don't know it. It's the same with a lot of the cultural references that we think that we can spell out in footnotes or jam together in some kind of portmanteau terminology. It just doesn't work. And we need somebody from French or German literature or Spanish or Italian literature to tell us that it doesn't work. And that person for us has been Richard Seberg, who uh, last year held our first collaborative workshop, which was designed to help us broach the most terrifying of all things to translate, which is poetry. And thanks to him, we felt hugely liberated from preconceptions and poor practices. And so we asked him to be kind enough to come back and this year put us through uh, our paces with this particular work. And I think we discovered more than ever this year that yet another ingredient which is essential to making a translation work, and I think this must be truer of Arabic than perhaps of many other literatures, is to hear the sound of our voices, to hear what it sounds like. Now, of course, this is particularly appropriate for medieval Arabic literature, for Arabic literature right up until now, because people read it out loud, they say it out loud, and the habit of silent reading, which is the habit of scholars and pedants, is quite inappropriate. These things must be tried out alive, live. We must read things to each other and make sure that they don't sound silly and that they make the impression that we think that they were meant to make. And uh, to take up what Shaukat was saying about not uh, claiming to be uh, rather clever people standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, there is a great precedent for this in the English language, and it is the great King James or authorised version, the translation of the Bible, that was made very early in the 17th century, that was based on 16th century translations, and that was made by people doing exactly what we're doing, going away, doing their stint, coming back, sitting round the table together, and reading it to each other and agreeing on what was the sound that was appropriate to a particular passage. Um, so I think that that is a great tradition that we ought to remind ourselves of every time we think we've been here for four hours now, isn't it time for tea? Uh, because this is a method which can produce sometimes very good results. Why was I so enthusiastic about this choice when it was sent to me to write a report on it? It is because the library is starting out with some very, very heavyweight works, the Risala of Ashafi'i, um, the Risala al Ghufran, and Asaq al Asaq is also heavy going. And also, these are rather extraordinary works. And we wanted, among other things, to give all readers a taste of what is more perhaps the bread and butter of all readers. Everybody is perhaps not going to have read uh, the Risala. Even if they were interested in fiqh, they may have asked somebody else to you know, make it a bit easier for them than that. But everybody would have read the kind of book that this is. This is the kind of social glue in reading. Unfortunately, though, many of the types of work of which this is one are not little works like this that can be translated quite quickly and read slowly and savoured without a feeling, you know, there are 350 more pages, I'd better get a move on. Some of them, most of them, in fact, are rather large. So this presented the advantage of being a typical work of what we will call mature adab, but in small format. So what is in it? It is a collection of anecdotes in its first half about women who are associated with caliphs in a particular way. And these stories are all 
taken from the great works of the 9th and 10th centuries, and they are circulated outside the covers of this book in many versions. And that makes this book typical in a way, too, because we get a lot of this reusing of materials throughout uh, Arabic literature. These are stories about women whose relation to the caliph in the first half of the book is that of court entertainers and often concubines. The author of this book was particularly interested in this subject. He was interested in women and he was interested in women in relation to holders of power. In his preface, he tells us that he had already written one book on this subject, a book about women whose sons became caliphs. And he thought it would be a good idea to write a book about the other women who were associated with caliphs. The first book no longer exists as far as we know. This book is the remnant that survives of his enormous output as a very important historian of political events. So a perfectly mainstream and traditional historian with a very large and impressive output, very well known and respected in his day, who decided that a really interesting subject, so interesting that he wanted to treat it twice, was the women of the entourage of the caliphs. The first part of the book, as I say, contains material that had been doing the rounds for quite a long time beforehand, but had never been presented in quite this light. The second half of the book consists of material that is closer to the author in time, and it concerns the great women of the Seljuk court, who were of a rather different kind from these early Abbasid learned entertainers who were also beautiful and uh, sought after. Uh, the ladies, the great ladies of the Seljuk court were a rather different uh, matter. Ibn Sa'i lived uh, over a long period. He lived from 1197 to 1276. And as you will all know, about two thirds of the way through his life, 1258 comes the Mongol sack of Baghdad. So he lived through that, and he was still in Baghdad when he died, living, it seems, something like the kind of life that he had lived before. The book about the caliph's women was written before the uh, uh, Mongol catastrophe. We know that because there is internal evidence he speaks of dates and caliphs uh, in the book, which shows that it was composed before the Mongol invasion. This period was a kind of Indian summer, everybody agrees. Things seemed to be going well with the caliphate. Although it had shrunk, it had had a final blaze of glory early in the 13th century and early in Ibn Sa'i's own life under Anasir li Dinullah. He was a caliph who managed to reinstate the caliphate perhaps not as a real power, but as a power that punched considerably above its weight and uh, acquired great uh, respect in uh, dip diplomacy between the then existing uh, Muslim states. He was followed by a succession of rulers who uh, seem to have left a very lyrical impression on the historians who record their reigns. Um, we hear of Baghdad being a wonderful place replete with men of learning, with public works, and so on and so forth. Uh, and perhaps this idyllic view of Baghdad in the reign of the very last Abbasid caliphs owes something to the terrible disruption that then followed with the Mongol invasion. But there does seem to have been quite a consensus, not just among people who lived in Baghdad, but travelers to Baghdad, that this was a highly agreeable, highly cultured, most civilized city in which great intellects were at work, among them Ibn Sa'i. So we have a work which dates from this last period of the Abbasid Caliphate, which looks back on the Caliphate through the lens of women's history. 
Ibn Nasai didn't invent women's history because we find quite a number of earlier writers in Arabic who are interested in the lives of women and in the specificities of the lives of women, whether they be court entertainers or uh, muhaddithat or other kinds of women. But I think, as far as we know for the present, that Ibn Sa'i was probably the first to frame general political history through the lens of women's share in it, however tangen tangential or important that share may have been. And that is, I think, a very interesting, more than interesting, a really deeply, uh, it's something that should make us scratch our heads and think deeply. We haven't really had time to think about that question in trying to scratch the surface of a true translation of this work, but it is a very important question. What was he doing? Why was he doing it? Uh, it may be that there was some feminine influence from the court at work here. He was very well viewed at the caliphal court and women were very powerful and influential in the last days of the Abbasid Caliphate as indeed they had been during the Seljuk period of overlordship in Baghdad. So that is a possible explanation, but it may not be uh, the whole explanation, even if it is part of it. There is, for a book of this size, a surprising amount of suggestive ideas and what appears to be actual uh, useful documentary fact in this book. One of the useful documentary facts is the uh, information that Ibn Sa'i is careful to give us whenever he can find it about where one of these women was buried and the circumstances of her funeral. The funerary topography of Baghdad seems to be a very important theme among later Abbasid historians in particular. We find it already, of course, in Tariq Baghdad, but it's particularly highly developed by Ibn al-Jawzi in the 12th century, who records as much material as he possibly can about funerals, burial places, the state of repair of tombs, um, whether they were built by the person who occupied them, or whether they were um, <coughs> built for them after their death. All this kind of material is uh, set out extensively by Ibn al-Jawzi. And just a little bit later, we find uh, Ibn Sa'i doing a similar uh, job of mapping the funerary geography of Baghdad, something which may be of great interest to people who are trying to rediscover the physical geography of Baghdad, uh, something for which it becomes harder and harder to uh, find any actual physical evidence above ground now. Another matter on which we get tantalizing snippets of information in Ibn Sa'i is the relationship between women and various kinds of knowledge. He tells us about uh, slave women in particular, or it seems to be exclusively in relation to slave women, but he tells us that they transmitted the works of sometimes other slave women, poetic works. Or in one case, we have a slave woman who is the rawiya of the prince poet Ibn al-Mu'taz. Of others, we are simply told that they transmitted, and we're not told what they transmitted, whether it was hadith or poetry. Though in one case of a slave girl who was a skilled musician and poet, uh, of whom we are told that she transmitted without being told what she transmitted, we are also told that she was sufficiently respected by a judge, a qadi, that he, in turn, became the transmitter of some of her work. And an example of this is given in the anecdote that illustrates her life. It is a poem. Particularly where the Seljuk princesses are concerned, or the concubines of the later Abbasid caliphs, 
what we find is not their intellectual contribution as musicians and poets. What is framed instead is their participation or their initiative in public works, in building works in particular. There again, we've got something which reinforces the kind of information that we find in other historians. And we find one absolutely fascinating uh, and quite extensive piece of information about a late Abbasid caliph who owns a slave woman who is his concubine, who has in fact been trained and educated by a Seljuk lady. She becomes the caliph's concubine and she is so important and so wealthy that she in fact has within the caliphal bu bureaucracy a bureaucracy of her own which seems to have parallel uh, um, subdivisions in it to those of the caliphal bureaucracy itself. And this is something which is now being studied extensively uh, in relation to the Ottoman Sultanate, women's uh, administrative apparatus and their actual economic and administrative clout is something which is coming to light. Like many things that have been held not to exist, we find that if we look, it is there. And this project, finally, a collaborative project which was launched by people who were absolutely instrumental in bringing out of texts which had been read inattentively many times before, the fact that not only biography is extremely common in Arabic, it's probably the most common literary form, but biography that tells you something intimate and uh, revealing about the subject, and furthermore, autobiography, a genre which people had stoutly maintained for decades, was hardly represented in any uh, meaningful sense in Arabic, well, this team found it and uh, have been able to point the way to other people finding plenty more. So I feel that their translation of this work is in that tradition which they themselves have laid down. And although it is a short work, I think that it is going to be full of not only interesting and in some cases delightful discoveries, but quite often perhaps very important ones. So this is the, uh, what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to uh, invite the board to come to the stage. Maybe you can do that while I'm speaking. You could come and take your seats. Uh, Richard. We've selected a text. Uh, what happened was w when we were meeting with uh, Richard Seaberth yesterday, he said, well, we have to confine our text. I mean, what are we going to talk about over the next three days? We're not going to be able to talk about the whole thing. We did have a bit of a conversation led by, by Julia and Richard on general principles, but we needed to home in on something. And so we started with an elegy, or which, we started with a long poem, or a long passage which uh, Richard identified, and we decided that was something we were going to workshop. And we'll be closing tonight's proceedings with a recitation uh, of the Arabic, or part of the Arabic, and also a reading out of the, uh, of the English. And uh, we also thought it might be useful to, to take one of the biographies and do the whole thing and workshop it. And then also we had in mind tonight's event, bring that to the group. We didn't select this particular one other than that it was short. That is to say all are very interesting, all have challenges. This one fit on a page on the screen. Uh, and so this is the one we'll be talking about. Uh, it's a single manuscript, and so we're able to look at it to find out whether uh, the published edition, which Julia can probably hold up, uh, has any errors or any, any problems. It's a very good edition, but it was based on a manuscript that he received, the editor received in, in, in photocopy, I, believe, I mean in, in microfilm, and he hadn't actually seen the original thing. We requested the, uh, the manuscript from the library in Istanbul. By and large, it's accurate, although there are some times that you need to go back to the manuscript, and we'll see that in one second, and I'm going to uh, read this to you, and then I'm going to introduce the scholars. 
So it's the one that begins on the right hand side. Qurratul Ain, Mawlat al Mu'tasima. Jariya Muwallada, Kanat Hadiya, and Al Imam al Mu'tasim Billah, Radiullah An. Warawa Anha, Al Qadi, Abu Bakr Ahmed ibn Kamil, ibn Khalaf, ibn Shajara, wa Kanat Adiba. And Ba'ani, Abu Muhammad Al, I believe it's Juba, was it Huba Bidi? Junabidi. Junabidi and Abi Bakr Al Hambali Kal Akbarana Abu Ghalib Al Karhi Idnan An Ubaidullah Ibn Ahmed Al Azhari Kal Haddathana Ibrahim Ibn Makhlad Kal Haddathana Ahmed Ibn Kamil Kal An Shadatna Kuratul Ain Al Mu'tasimiya Unzur Ilaya Bi'ain Al Safhi An Zalali La Tatrukaniya من أمري على وجلي روحي وروحك مقرونان في قرن فكيف أهجر من في هجره أجلي Now, it's fairly straightforward. For those of you who are not used to reading handwriting or manuscripts, it's a fairly straightforward thing. But I'll just alert you to the fact that in the first line of the poem, it says, أنظر إلي بعين السفح عن زلل لا And it looks like it says, تتركني But it doesn't, and we know that it doesn't by scanning it. And we can work out that it says Michael, the Tukaniya, right? Michael scanned it, then Julia scanned it, then Joe scanned it. We decided it was Basit. And knowing that it was Basit, we knew how we were supposed to read it and how many beats there were supposed to be. So even though it's a fairly easy hand to read, it's a very good manuscript, there are things that you sometimes need to check. So in our workshop, we actually each had a photocopy of the manuscript. We had a photocopy of the published edition. And we had the draft translation, and we got to work. And we're going to get to work now. I'm going to just introduce them briefly, starting from the other end. Devin Stewart is a professor of Arabic at Emory. Chip Rossetti, and he's on the editorial board. Chip Rossetti is the managing editor of the Library of Arabic Literature and an accomplished translator of modern literature. James Montgomery is my co-executive editor on the board, is a Sir Thomas Adams professor of Arabic at Cambridge known affectionately as the Tommy Adams. Joe Lowry is a professor of Arabic at the University of Pennsylvania. Richard Seaberth is professor of French and Comparative Literature at NYU. Michael Cooperson is professor of Arabic at UCLA. I've already introduced, but I'm happy to introduce again, Julia Bray, Laudian professor of Arabic at the University of Oxford, and Phil Kennedy, professor extraordinaire at NYU. So we mentioned Tahir as well. We are, uh, yes, we have one uh, editor who had to leave today to attend a conference, or chose to leave today to attend a conference in Cairo, Tahara Qutbuddin, professor of Arabic at the University of Chicago. So, folks, what I thought we would do is uh, I would pick, so I'm going to come and sit with you, but I would pick certain aspects of the translation. I'm going to try and call it up now using my advanced technical skills that you already saw at work just now. Ha! Uh, this is what we have and what we came up with. Actually, it may help for me to read it. Balm to the eyes, a member of al Mu'tasim's household, a foreign parentage, born into slavery among the Arabs. She was a favorite concubine of the Caliph, al Mu'tasim Billah. God be pleased with him. She was a most accomplished woman, and the judge Abu Bakr Ahmed ibn Kamil ibn Khalaf ibn Shajara thought so highly of her, of her work, that he quoted it. There's a little footnote there, which I'll explain later. We were informed by Abu Muhammad al Junabidi, who cites Abu Bakr al Hambali, who cites Abu Ghalib al Qarqi, who, with his permission, cites Ubaidullah ibn Ahmad al Azhari, as saying that Ibrahim ibn Makhlad reported to him, relating that the judge Ahmad ibn Kamil said. <laughs> and we will get in a minute to why it then repeats the judge Ahmad ibn Kamil. We heard these verses directly from Baum to the eyes, Al Mu'tasim's concubine. Please overlook this mistake I've made. Don't leave me here wondering where I stand. Your soul and mine are bound together. If you spurn me, how would I survive? So I'd like to start with the beginning, which is the name, Balm to the Eyes. This is to render Qurratul Ain. And I'd like to invite, well, it can be anyone really, Michael Cooperson, to talk a little bit about the name. You'll be happy to see that I have for you as a prop that possible translations for Qurratul Ain, eye candy. Harmony, eyes delight, lovely to look on, easy on the eyes, sight for sore eyes, and the one we selected provisionally, balm to the eyes. Just for the record, I don't like it. I don't like it, but some people love it. So, Michael. Well, we, 
we had the words in Arabic, uh, and we explained them to Richard, who said, well, that to me sounds like eye candy. Now, eye candy is an English expression which applies to someone who is easy on the, eye, easy on the eyes. Someone that you like to look at. Right? And like to display on your arm, I feel. Uh, and we tried it for a while, and then it occurred to us that in English it is funny and possibly demeaning. Derogatory, yeah. Derogatory. Uh, whereas in Arabic uh, it applies to anyone you like to look at, including children. And it's used in that sense in the Quran. So then we thought, well, perhaps we should try something else. Uh, the next choice was sight for sore eyes. And our collaborator, who isn't here, Tahira, uh, said, well, you know, why have the word sore in there? When, once you have the word sore in there, um, you detract from the sense that it's a pleasant name. Didn't you say your sister's name was that? And it turned out, Tahira confessed to us, that her sister is named Qurrat al -Ain, which really, at least for me, makes it impossible uh, for us to call her eye candy. Um, <laughs> and so then, she may be. And then we went back to the drawing board, and I think, Richard, you were the one who voted finally definitively for balm, on, balm of the eyes, balm to the eyes. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us about why you felt that was the best choice. Well, just, it is a, an operative expression in English. Someone is a bomb to it, so maybe slightly archaic, but, but uh, that it is uh, this kind of uh, soothing and pleasing uh, uh, figure. It, it, it gets away. I know you were saying you were trying to come up with sort of James Bond girl terms for a lot of these uh, concubines. It's, it's uh, hyphenated. It's, it's a little distanced. Uh, it's obviously um, it's something that you could find in some version in a uh, medieval French romance, you know. Um, um, again, it's, these are just not definitive. Um, actually, if there's anybody out, out here who I, 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 I saw somebody shake their uh, head about bomb to the eyes and, and uh, if, if uh, we are ready to, uh, for any other suggestions. Do you have your hand up? I thought I, I, thought I, saw, I saw a negative. A oh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, because I remember my uncle used to write to his wife, starting with the word mm. yeah. mm. The way it was explained to me when I was studying Arabic, uh, well, it's the opposite in a sense of a qadha, right? Qadha is the something in your eye that causes something painful that falls into your eye that causes it to hurt and to water. And qurrat al ain is something cool and soothing placed on the eye that makes it feel better, and by extension, therefore, is anything pleasant to look at. But it is a strange word because qurra, after all, doesn't appear in any other collocation and doesn't appear by itself that we know of, or at least that I know of. So it is a very strange word. And, and that makes us feel comfortable, in a sense, with choosing a rather odd uh, yeah. collocation in English because if balm to the eyes sounds a bit funny to you in English, well, that's how it sounds in Arabic as well. At least that's, that's how we feel. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you have a... Okay, I think for Ibrahim, this is the most uh, lovely one for me, or the most, the most loved one for me. Mm -hmm. I think so. And the other thing that this is the only woman I look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should be in this context. Because I know very well what, what did we mean when mm -hmm. we told her that. So here for Ibrahim, and something else here, the word slavery, the word is slave is wrong. Because you should, you should show others what does it mean by slave in this context. Because for Arab people, slave has nothing to do with the word slave in general. It's a perfect. I mean, those are slave, for example, like when I say the caliph has a slave, it's not slave. These, some of them uh, write poetry, create poetry, or even repeat or recite by heart. Uh, many of them, uh, the caliph used, for example, when a poet comes, 
and uh, to get some money because he wrote a new masterpiece, for example, he would tell him, oh, even my, uh, my maid knows this. Then she repeats behind the whole point. Mm -hmm. Then he has somebody who will repeat from the third time, which means she is not a slave. I mean, maybe he, he bought her or maybe he paid something, but, but the question of slave here is wrong. I mean, to say she's a slave because anyone will read this text and will say slave, this means she cleans the whole day, she, uh, she does something, for example, not agreeable, whatever. Well, if, if I could just say one thing about that point, it's a good point, and it's one that Richard has brought to our attention when collaborating. No word means anything by itself. So you're absolutely right. If you took the word slave and you presented it to an English speaker, many of especially Americans, I mean, we have a history of that, right? We know about slavery. Uh, it means a certain thing to us, right? But if you read this anecdote, this anecdote precisely illustrates the point you just made. And so when the word slave appears at, in this story, the English reader realizes that, well, a slave isn't quite the same thing in this context as it was. But on the other hand, if you were to uh, cover that word in some way to hide it, you would be hiding the fact that these were human beings who were bought and sold. It can't be, we can't forget that. Why don't we introduce a new word for this? I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Why not? You are translators. I mean, you can do that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this actually leads us into a point that's going to address exactly what you've raised. So what I'd like to do is, 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 and I don't mean to cut this off, I'm happy, we're happy to continue, all of us are here to speak with you about this, but it leads very nicely into the next thing. So the, the, the thing begins, the, the entry begins, Kurratul Ain Mawla al Mu'tasim, and there's this word Mawla there, and then it says, Jariya Muwallada Kanat Hadiya. Okay, so there's the word Mawla, there's the word Jariya, there's the word Muwallada, and Hadiya. And I'd like to ask Joe Lowry, because of his extensive knowledge of Islamic law, this is the translator of the Risala of Shafi'i and a professor of Islamic law, to walk us through some of the ways in which we got to this translation, uh, how we chose member of Mu'tasim's household, and how we went to of foreign parentage born into slavery among the Arabs she was a favorite concubine of, uh, from the very, um, the very um, few words in the Arabic text. Perhaps I could add the initial draft uh uh, translation, which I didn't quite understand, was she was a slave girl of mixed background, a concubine, etc. And I said, what is a, a someone of mixed background and a slave girl? And I think, uh, Julia, and then you explained exactly, um, because it doesn't really say she is a slave here, the way it is born into slavery among the Arabs. Um, but maybe you could, uh, both of you gave very interesting historical and cultural explanations for this. Well, I think uh, when we tried to render these single Arabic terms, we all had to reflect on the fact that they are also not without ambiguity. Um, so f the word maula, for example, which we rendered a member of al Tassim's household, uh, actually denotes a fairly precise uh, legal relationship, or two, two possible legal relationships. One, uh, being a freed woman. It's a word that refers to the legal tie that exists between a freed slave and their former master. And the other is somebody who is contracted with a patron uh, to represent that person in society and give that person a status. Right? This is the way that people came into early Islamic society, was by um, uh, finding patrons and having these people give them a kind of social identity, which uh, you, in the earliest stage of Islam really only belonged to a tribal elite from Western Arabia. And you su suggested the name, uh, the, uh, a provisional translation, client. And I said, well, client, well, yes, from your point of view, client patron relation. You know, but, right. and, and, but that and, doesn't work here. And we, we use that term because it's a term that's in use in regard to Roman society. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not something that everybody's familiar with. So that was one ambiguity we had to negotiate, and we decided that since we could not, you know, the, the text does not explicitly say in what sense this woman is a maula in relationship to the caliph, we chose a slightly more ambiguous uh, formulation, which suggested that she was attached to his household, whether um, contractually or um, through ownership. And I think we probably suspect it's, uh, it's the latter. So then we have, yeah? There is, a, there is another point about this term. It, its meaning progresses as time goes yes. on, so it's not necessarily what you find in law books. 
and historians of this period talk about a certain number of people as being the maula of the caliph or the maula of another important person in the Abbasid state. And there it's clear that the relationship is somebody who has joined, as it were, the power group or the household of that person, but who is important in their own right. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth tagging them as being in a relationship with that person. So that, I think, addresses part of your objection to uh, the way the status of the person is well rendered. Um, mm-hmm. excuse, sorry, excuse me. Um, might I suggest the word courtesan? Yeah, well, this is certainly a word that we, we mentioned many times today. Um, mm-hmm. uh, let, let me just go through a couple of the other words before we get back to this, because that's, that's a, a good suggestion, and it's a word that we, we thought of. Um, the next word, jaria, um, actually... Is, is really barely represented in our translation in a way, but it's a word that can mean young girl, but it can also mean a, a paid um, or owned performer in the um, caliphal establishment. Uh, then we have the word muwallada, and this is also a word that um, is not free from complexity and denotes uh, probably in this context a woman who was born in an Arabic-speaking environment and uh, raised uh, to be a performer. That's what we understand from it. And so uh, it's not very efficient, but we've had to render this with two phrases, right? A foreign parentage born into slavery among the Arabs. And then hadiya finally is a word which means favored, although by extension it can also mean something like concubine. So um, it also presents problems of translation. Thanks. I, another thing to keep in mind is this uh, Words, words change meaning. So one of your points about your point about slavery, you know, one of the ways that one can change what slavery means is to use slavery in all its contexts, not tie it to only one. If we only understand slavery to mean a certain kind of servitude, we'll only understand it that way. If you if we produce a book in which slavery describes highly accomplished performers at the caliphal court, which is what some of the people in this are, then it changes what people understand. I mean, we've seen this, for example, when when people refer to slave soldiers, right? The idea, for example, in North America, where many of us, perhaps probably in England as well, teach, if you say slave, the implication is the person has no power and also no authority. And yet, a slave soldier is empowered by the state with weapons to carry out the needs of the state. And so the the way to change what slavery means or what concubine means or what performer means is to to make much more available to people the, the wide range of the meanings of those words. And again, not to cut us off, I'd really like to walk you through a lot of the issues that, we ra- that were raised. So let me move on to another one, uh, if, you, if you let me. Um, Just I, can, a small could, could you, can, we keep it for, can we keep it for the end? Because I'd like to have people, I mean, I know you're very interested in this, and we will all happily talk with you. I'm not trying to cut you off. But I do want to get us to other things. You'll see that one of the next uh, things that happens is we've changed, we've translated Quratul Ayn as bomb to the eyes, but we didn't translate Al Mu'tasim Billah. Right, for example, and we're not, we're not going to talk about this right now, but mm. it's something to keep in mind. These are all decisions, right? Every single step is a decision. What is my decision? What is our decision going to mean for the reader, right? Um, God be pleased with him. And I'd like to ask Devin Stewart to speak a little bit about God be pleased with him, عنه, but also your suggestion when we started out um, about including that list of pious phrases. Well, in uh Arabic and Islamic writings, there are a number of set phrases that are blessings that appear after people's names, and uh, in many texts they occur very frequently, so it can be intrusive and, and uh, somehow interfere with your experience of reading if you are reading it in another language. Uh, some people take them out, uh, but like the names, they give information. Uh, so it, it, it one one uh, possible uh, way to deal with them is to, is to keep them and to try to translate them in a way that gives something of the meaning. They can be important. Uh, they can tell you whether the person is dead or alive. You know, if it says, Rahimahullah, you know, oh, he's dead, right? If it says, Abqahullah, you know he's alive. And some of them can tell you that the writer is a Shiite or a Sunni, right? Uh, so it seems uh, useful to keep them. If you take them out, you're losing some information. So, uh, but it is difficult to render them in a way that doesn't interfere with the rest of the text and sort of interfere with the flow of the narrative. 
And it's uh, not a simple decision to do this. And it's also not a simple, dis uh, simple uh, task to find an equivalent in English that works. Because in some cases, is, you know, some blessings we just don't say in English. Like, this wouldn't show up here, but when you say Naiman, you know, you don't say congratulations for taking a shower, you know, it's like a... Um, well, we're getting a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is a real problem, because sometimes we don't uh, have, have an equivalent that we, would, that we would say. And they often tell you the category of person that is mentioned, so only certain people have Radiallahu Anhu after, and you know uh, what this is. So again, it, we, we made a list of kind of standard suggestions for, for um, our series. I'm not entirely happy with all of them. Some are quite difficult to really just to figure out what does it mean. Uh, well, so. the, well the, mo the, most, the most famous one, and the one that really, really annoys me, is in almost all English language translations, especially pious ones, of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see PBUH, or Peace Be Upon Him. Peace Be Upon Him is a translation of Alayhi Salam. It is not a translation of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So not only is it mistranslated, mm -hmm. it's then abbreviated in a way to kind of, yes. sort of, um, almost um, to kind of uh, cement it in the, in, the, in mm -hmm. the mind. We all think, oh, you didn't put PBUH after this. Right. Well, PBUH would be the wrong one anyway. You would put, if you were going to use PBUH, you'd use it after the other prophets yeah. or after the archangels and so on. And so, but, but then and, the difficulty then, was we couldn't translate it, though. We couldn't come yeah. up with a translation right. that we were all happy with for Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because people translate it, they say, may God pray on the prophet. Well, God doesn't need to pray because he is in charge. So people could pray, but clearly it doesn't mean that he should pray. Sort of like the problem in, in translating from Homeric Greek, what do you do with the formula, formulaic uh, epithets? The you know, studies of oral Homer now show that they are there to kind of just fill in a metrical pattern, you know, the wine dark sea or the da 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 da, you know, but and, and uh, they, they're, they're mnemonics uh, and they help in oral composition and what do you do with all of these texts that, in fact, have a high level of just for formulaic, um, I wouldn't call it padding, but um, upholstery? You know? So could I, could I ask you to build on that, uh, Richard, and in, perhaps in a conversation with James about metrics and about what decisions one has to make translating poetry? and whether one is going to preserve Arabic uh, poetry until very recently. It was very well known for being in a specific meter. Uh, you, can, you can depart from the meters, but you depart from the meters in specific ways. Uh, mono and rhyme. Uh, many strictures, and our translations seem to have captured none of those. Why? And uh, presumably partly because of the English reader. And James, if you could kind of provide counterpoint on some of these, some of these choices. So do you want to leap back down to here, or? I thought, let's just use this one since it's here. Um, um, well, I think you said something very important that we've been working out is, um, um, and this has to do for the translation of poetry as well. Um, very famous American translator from the French, uh, Richard Howard, was asked, well, how do you translate this word? And he says, well, I don't translate words, meaning, you, you are always translating phrasally, clausally. You have to understand what kind of units you're, 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 uh, you're translating. And for poetry, that would be in terms of sort of rhythmic units, which are not necessarily transpositions of the original meter. There is a kind of a distinction between meter and rhythm. Um, and so we were... Uh, uh, in approaching um, the poems, we were thinking about sort of these larger phrasal questions. Um, we were also thinking, um, because uh, these texts are meant to highlight sometimes the very plaintive uh, and moving speech of these uh, singing women, um, that we that, that it was also important to get a quality of direct speech or voice, which meant uh, stripping maybe a lot of the ornament away to get at, uh, you know, kind of the, 
the, the psychological uh, dramatization of a voice in the process of, of self-expression or address. So, so uh, you know, the, this kind of uh, um, the lesson of sort of the dramatic monologue. So those were, those were some of the considerations, at least in uh, um, these short quotations from uh, uh, these women, these courtesans, these... Uh, um, uh, um, clients to caliphs um, that are supposed to, in, in a few words, epitomize um, their situation. So the key was to go for a certain level of brevity, concentration, um, an almost epigrammatic uh, quality. Uh, all of that seemed to be <coughs> more important than a kind of a slavish and ultimately futile attempt to mime uh, uh, meters that um, often would go against the grain of English rhythm. Um, yeah. But I. Uh, <coughs> so there are many, many beautiful poems in Arabic, and there are many, many ugly translations of those beautiful poems into European languages. And this is the problem that we confront. And one of the things we're really interested in thinking about is why do we think those poems, those translations don't succeed? And on one level, what the translator is trying to do is to capture everything that that translator perceives to be in the Arabic in order not to leave anything out, in order not to miss anything, in order somehow to take, in a sense, what is poetic about the original, um, uh, leave it behind, and then resort to the dictionary and provide uh, a, a kind of prose version uh, of, of the Arabic. And with the permission of my, my, my friends, I will quote, <coughs> quote from the original version uh, of the poem that we have, please overlook. Uh, and um, if we had the Arabic up on the screen, it might be uh, quite interesting to compare it. Well, we only have the, uh, I think that we only have... So it's unzuri layya bi'ayn sahi an zallali. So the original version that we were confronted with was, look at me with an eye of pardon for my mistakes. Don't leave me anxious wondering where I stand. Your soul and mine are yoked together in one body. So how can I abandon the one whose abandonment will cause me to perish? Now, that's roughly what the Arabic says. And so if you are looking in the classroom to unpack all of the bits that are in those, those bites, that's what you would do. And that musically would be called sight reading. Yes. <laughs> as opposed to actually an interpretive performance, uh, Glenn Gould doing Bach, as opposed to someone just sitting there uh, doing all the notes. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't want to do the notes. We don't want to do the notes. What we're trying to do is um, <coughs> we realize that we have to make a number of sacrifices. And those sacrifices are informed by choices which are very personal. What, what the poem says to you, what you hear in the poem, what, um, and often uh, because the people who created this uh, astonishing body of poetry were masters at combining different le uh, lexical registers and different lexica and different um, uh, um, uh, uh, intonations and allusions, often one reader won't catch all of them. We can't, in a translation of a poem, catch everything. So what we want to do is just to give, give a sense of what we were hearing in this poem. And what we were hearing in the original was a very heartfelt, straightforward, emotionally direct plea. And so if we pull up the original, instead of look at me with an eye of pardon for my mistakes, we get please overlook this mistake I've made. Don't leave me anxious, wondering where I stand. We come to, don't leave me here, wondering where I stand. 
because she's about to be abandoned. She's being left behind. She is anxious, of course, but don't leave me here. Says, I, you know, I'm going to be really upset by this. This is, this is, this is um, really hurting me. And then we get this well, really... That is something that someone could actually say in yes. English. Don't leave me here. Uh, you would never say, don't leave me anxious. I mean, right? This is, this is not something that in English, you would say, you know, and you, that's, that's the other rule. If you're trying to catch a voice, Pound talks about this, you know, you have to imagine someone in some sort of possible situation actually saying these words, right? And more idiomatic, it's, don't leave me here. You know, we, we even started with, don't leave me hanging, you know? Well, that was a little, right? Which leads very nicely, I think, into uh, something that Chip can talk to us about. Because one of the things that we, we face, we struggle with, is how does it sound natural? How does it sound idiomatic? And yet, we don't want it to sound too modern, right? We don't want to say, don't leave me hanging on or something. Because we may, it may feel like we're trying to over-modernize the text or make it too, too much like something we, we use today. And Chip is uniquely positioned to speak to this because he is a published translator of uh, Ahmed Khaled Tawfiq's Utopia and also I Can we use forsake instead of don't leave me here, do not forsake me? Could be, but and I we think might... it's more poetical. Mm -hmm. Instead of leaving, that's so crude. You know, forsaking mm -hmm. is more like heartfelt. Okay, that, that is a good, uh, you know, don't forsake me, oh my darling. If you, if you leave no, your no, name with us... Darling bit. No, no, but that's a, that's a, that's a great old, uh, that's a great old uh, folk song, you know. We're happy to include anyone in our future deliberations, by the way. So if you keep your and name... If you can say soulmates, instead of saying your soul and mine are bound together, can we not say soulmates? Our hearts are together in the heart of, heart of my heart. Well, there was, there was a comment on, on the actual classical Arabic uh, yoking. Um, yes. I mean, what, what she does there is, is, is she takes um, uh, uh, an idea that had been... Um, popularized uh, through uh, the translations of, of, of Greek philosophy, and she uses a, a notion that um, uh, each of our souls throughout our lives is looking from the one that was separated from before we were born. And we wanted to bring across not just soulmate, but that these two were so, in, they, they were so closely bound together yeah they were so bound together that 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 they couldn't possibly be parted in the sense of bo bonded yeah uh there was a suggestion yeah, intertwined and that seemed to be a little bit too specific um although some of us preferred it some of the, some and of we the, ended yeah. up i mean we had to decide you know we i i should say that we just this we did this very recently uh we've we've only been looking at this, this was this morning this was this morning uh, and so things, you know, have to be, and there's this an advantage to kind of committing to something provisionally and then deciding, or yeah. as, um, as uh, one of the great scholars of the previous generation would say, uh, let it go cold, come back to it a week, three weeks later, and see how you feel about it then. Mm -hmm. And this is partly what I wanted Chip to, to I'm sorry I didn't see your hand. And that your, forsake may yeah. actually come back, you know? Right, Suddenly, and we have it now in our, you yeah. know? But I wanted, Chip, I want to talk about what, what the differences are in your mind between taking a modern Arabic text produced three years ago, one year ago, putting it into an idiomatic English or readable English for the modern reader, as opposed to working with something that's um, purporting to represent words spoken a thousand years ago, right? And how you put that into an English that is still accessible to Richard and to a readership, and yet isn't overplaying that. I mean, do you have, what are your thoughts on that? Right, well, that also, there's also a second issue uh, beyond that is um, uh, translating uh, from a modern text, uh, one issue that you don't have to deal with, which is central to Library of Arabic Literature, is um, the question of the manuscript tradition, where uh, for all of these texts, with the exception of this one being a, a, a single manuscript, um, all of these we are dealing with multiple versions of a, uh, of a single manuscript, and so part of, the, uh, of our, our system is that uh, and translator is not simply a translator but an editor translator and has to produce an authoritative edition uh, by comparing and viewing a number of these manuscripts, the originals, uh, which of course is a, 
uh, something you don't really have to do much with in, in modern uh, translation, translating a, a modern text uh, that's been printed for the most part. Um, so that's one issue. Uh, and the other uh, issue is what we've all been sort of talking about is, is the question of register, um, starting with uh, the very first thing with this, which was eye candy, our first, I think it was our first uh, suggestion from Richard uh, uh, for the translation of Qurat al Ain. And as you could tell, we had sort of about eight or nine different versions there. And of course, the, um, that becomes central is how do you sort of, how familiar do you want these to sound? Uh, and how there's the danger, of course, of going overboard uh, with a very sort of don't leave me hanging. Um, and certainly for someone who, like myself, comes from, uh, is more familiar with translating modern Arabic literature, there really is, um, it's a useful reminder to see uh, uh, how terms have shifted semantically or uh, how much of this came out of a context, cultural, philosophical, social context where uh, a word that has sort of perhaps has lost some of those in the 21st century, something published 2009, uh, compared to the context that Ibn al-Sai was writing in. Um, so, uh, and so it's really in this sense, it's, uh, I, I always think of the phrase, the past is a foreign country, and in many ways um, this certainly illustrates this. How many of these, we have to very much be careful, in this, which is why when there are nine people around a table, you get this kinds of um, uh, uh, semantics, these sort of uh, uh, allusions picked up that at least one of the nine will have uh, noticed. And, and some of whom, whose ears respond to, in very subtle ways, to British English, mm -hmm. and others whose ears respond to American English. Uh, we are, you know, two countries separated by a common language, as they say. And um, um, yeah, we kind of agreed to uh, arrive at a kind of a mid-Atlantic uh, middle style, um, but there were definitely interesting moments where, to my British ear, you know, especially uh, those, those areas of, of English which are so amazingly interesting and difficult, which is prepositions. Um, so I'm sorry to interrupt. I'll ask one more question, just quickly, because obviously if you, you're, you're translating authors that are still alive. Yes. Because these are all authors that are, are long dead, and so does that make, is that a big difference? It can both help and hinder. Um, uh, obviously, it, it's a, it is a great resource. If we could have Ibn al-Sai here to sort of um, ask him what exactly he meant, or, what, or, or even to quote that line herself, what did you mean? Um, it, it would have been very helpful is to have her sit in on these conversations. So yes, it's certainly, it's a, it's a, big, um, it's a big difference. Um, and uh, of course, there's an unbridgeable gap of uh, a thousand or twelve hundred years between um, uh, what, we're, what we were doing here today versus what uh, what the original context for these lines would have been. So, there were, sorry, there were some other um, <coughs> issues that we were going to talk about, but I, uh, we're conscious of time, and we really do want to take more questions. And so, I'm sorry to have cut you off earlier, but we'll, you'll have the opportunity to speak again. Uh, I just wanted to point out that among the things we were going to possibly talk about was. Um, at one point, Phil Kennedy uh, noticed that there might be a Quranic, or he thought there might be a Quranic allusion in one of the lines. And so this is something else that we have to grapple with, is, uh, is the material that we're reading alluding to an earlier text, whether it's Quran or an earlier poem, this kind of thing. It requires not only expertise on the part of the translator, but it requires attention to this, to make sure that we've caught an allusion. The other thing was the Isnads, and the, the reason that we've shaped, this is the, the, um, the transmission, that, that text that's in a small paragraph in smaller font. That was a decision that we made at the Library of Arabic Literature that when we have these long lists of authorities that it might be distracting to the reader uh, to see that just listed as part of prose and, and that you, you lose the attention of the reader. And so we set it apart. For those who are interested, they'll just keep reading them. For those who aren't, they can just skip, which is why we've, we've set it up that way. But those are the two things that I am not going to let the um, panel talk about, having just evoked them. Uh, what we'll do now, and we were going to read an elegy uh, which we translated, but what we'll do is we'll leave that for the very, very end. And so uh, you're welcome to stay and listen, but we really would like to give you uh, the opportunity to ask questions. I just tell you, there's a very bright glare and it's hard for me to see your hands, so um, you can sort of wave, uh, someone will see you and, and we'll, we'll gladly take questions. So when you read the original translation of the poem, that was awful. And then the way you did it here, it's beautiful. So balm to the eye, I think that's awful. Mm. Everything else you listed is awful. 
Why don't you keep the same name, the same way you did Al-Mu'tas and Billah? I mean, unless, because Qurrat Al-Ain is a beautiful name in Arabic. Yes. It's just, it's not coming beautiful. It's not coming through like that. As someone responsible for the original awful version of the poem, I think I should say that I like my earlier translation of her name better, <laughs> which is Eyes Delight. But there are always multiple possible living, renderings. That's the one that was kind of close to mm -hmm. the beauty of the original. Well, I, I think I, I liked, I'm also, can the original translators please stand, Kevin? <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, after yeah, that <laughs> judgment on the poem. No, no, I just want you to see that it's the same group. Yeah, right, right, we were right. involved, yeah, and so, and these things evolve, and I feel like we're on the on trial now, please, please sit down. But no, I, I, like, I like delight. I thought delight took care of it. I wanted one word, even though there's two in Arabic. And uh, James suggested harmony, and we said, well, it's not nothing to do with eyes. And he said, yes, but, but there's something about the word. I mean, because we were looking for a nice sounding word in English as well. Would you be happy with heart's delight? Because that's Right. 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 Oh, that's right. good, yes, right. that's good. Heart's Souls delight. Souls delight, something, yeah. something yeah. that yeah. really... Does, Joe, do you have some of the other names? I mean, I might, you know... We yeah, have I was names. just looking um, through. Like Gloria. Gloria, G-L-O-R-I-A. Mm -hmm. Well, it should, we should say that it's... it's I, I think, although we haven't translated the caliph's names, which one could well do, the, the women's names Here. are speaking names. They're names that they were given by the people who trained them. And they are um, sometimes perfidy. slightly salacious. Here's perfidy. Um, you know, they have, uh, or, or, or they're the kind of name you, um, they're, they're sort of nickname you might give your girlfriend. Um, sometimes they're not very nice, but I think it's important to be honest about the uh, social context, even though some of these women were highly accomplished and um, very, very cultured um, poets and musicians of great But ability. it may well be, I mean, but, there are some. But what I don't understand is, okay, in Arabic, Many, many names have actual meaning, unlike yes. in English. Mm -hmm. But my no. name has a meaning, but when I say it to you or introduce myself, I don't introduce this meaning of my name. I give you my name. So my name is Hiba. It mm. means gift from yes. God. Yes. I yeah. did not get translated when yeah. I went to the States as okay. gift from God. But if Why you had, are you to. translating her but if name? You had been gifted, if you had been gifted as a slave woman to a caliph, and he then took, decided that he would call you Hiba. Our, our problem is deciding whether we should leave Hiba or translate it. We're, we, we're in agreement. We, we obviously names mean what they mean. If someone's name is, uh, you know, Abdul Latif, we don't say, oh, you know, servant of the, of the gentle one. We call them Abdul Latif. But because we understand that it's a name. But the question is, was that person given that name because specifically because of what it means? Because probably they were. And then, and, it, yeah, I mean, well, yes. There are uh, other people named Qurrat al Ain that are not slaves that's, and they're that's not true. given exactly. that name. And that's exactly true of the other, issue. Other of the women here, too. But Which is why we raised that issue. One of our own I'm board members this. said her sister's name is Qurrat yeah, al Ain. I'm not totally sure what that word is. This is an excellent point, and, we, and we, we take it to heart. Yeah, we take it to heart. Just to follow up on this, I guess I'd rather you err on the side of caution here and not translate any name, again, because Qurrat al-Ain is a name, it's like jihad is a name, so you do not say jihad is uh, whatever, uh, the, the meaning of jihad or hiba as, as the, the lady just mentioned. So it is a name, it stays a name. This is a, a one. And the other piece, when you talked about PBUH, and now there are certain things need to be introduced into the English language and be part of the English language like sallallahu alaihi wasallam right now people are using this as sallallahu alaihi wasallam they do not translate this so maybe it is time for us to start introducing some of these uh, words and make it part of the english lexicon uh, that's you you might be able to do that but it, you can't be done unilaterally uh, language changes by sort of social convention and one idea can't sort of be forced and, and get automatically accepted. So you notice that in many, many languages, things like inshallah get into the language and get used in Persian and Turkish and because they don't have an equivalent for that and that works and if everybody knows what it means and then, then it's okay. But if you just decide, well, I'm gonna uh, introduce my word into this language and I have a few French words I invented I think they should they should be incorporated into the French language uh, who's gonna listen to me you know so um, 
but, but things that with a name, there are names that carry meaning, and if you don't translate it, then you lose the meaning. So uh, it's a decision you, that you, you either want to lose the, recognize I'm going to lose the meaning of this, or, or I'm going to try to attempt to, to get the meaning across. So if you have somebody named, uh, you know, if you want to translate Hibba into English, it would be Dorothy, right? Gift of God, or something like this. Um, maybe. Uh, that might be strange, but... Uh, if you know, you know, both in Arabic and in English, there's a tradition among slaves, many slaves were given names that mean something white, right? So Pearl was a typical name of a slave woman in the United States uh, because these are kind of euphemisms that they have a certain kind of meaning uh, that reflect who this person is and what, what kind of name slaves have. Um, I just want to go back to the literal translation that you said, which was, don't leave me anxious wondering where I stand, right? Um, mm -hmm. The word anxious gives me a feeling that goes beyond what this is giving me now. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, I mean, can you put in anxious somewhere, like maybe don't leave me here anxiously wondering where I stand? Because anxious really gave me a feeling when, you know, she's anxious, but I can be wondering where I sound. I'm not necessarily very anxious. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because where do you draw the line, like the feeling you want to give, or is yeah. it like, mm -hmm. I don't know. No, it's a well, that's a nice, that's a nice solution. Is to, if, I, if I knew how to just where I stand, you know, that could be, it's a little formal, but, you know, maybe, you know. Um, Done. No. No, I mean, this is important. no, it's important for you this to understand that we're not, this is not final. It's provisional. And even when it's published, whenever that time comes, it will still not be final. Yeah, we're trying to present sort of a process of which you are part. And I mean, these are, these are good suggestions. I think we're, we're on to a very interesting, and it's a, it's a, it's a realm of translation practice and theory. Uh, having to do with onomastics and uh, the translation of proper names. Uh, proper names function very, very differently from common nouns, where you're kind of, uh, we're, we're by, by translating them, we're reducing their properness to a kind of common noun kind of thing, which is a, uh, which is a more descriptive of a class of things, which proper names linguistically do not work as. Uh, I mean, this is, you, we can get into uh, all kinds of forms of modal logic here in terms of, you know, philosophy of language, you know, and, you know, these are, these are big, big issues uh, in terms of, you know, uh, proper names, you know, and uh, why does London become Londres, you know, or uh, um, Livorno become Leghorn? I just want to comment something, is to look at the historical origin of Qurrat al-Ain. Qurrat al-Ain, it's a meaning of to describe something before it's become an, a noun or a name to name some people because it is really very rich in the meaning. So Qurrat al-Ain is, is from what we are using. I'm from Baghdad, so I, I'm just talking about our, our own Qurrat al-Ain, how it is used there. Mm -hmm. when, uh, Qurrat al-Ain could be used for women and men as well. I could say to my son, I want you to be Qurrat Aini, means somebody I'm proud of yes. and with love and with, with like, I, I want to see you the best or something I really feel proud of. So this is the in, inside, maybe one of the meanings of Qurrat al -Ain. So it, it start like this. So when it become a name, sometimes in these kind of secrets, you don't feel like it is a name. You can feel it as a name and the other meaning. So it's a kind of hard to translate. So keeping it as is won't help the Americans or the Western to understand what is this the meaning. I mean, okay, it is written as Qurrat al but it doesn't make sense to me. Right. So we need to add both and show that or give a kind of definition <laughs> or, or historical uh, phrase to show what is this means, mm -hmm. uh, if right. possible. And so this is, this is th thank you so much because mm -hmm. uh, not, I mean you notice I've added it in. One of the things that we did in the original version is we put one name in parentheses and we left one name and then decided to use it afterwards. 
That's one solution. Another solution, if you look at that little number one, after that he quoted it, it's a footnote. And it's, you know, we realize there are some places where we need to intervene. Well, something that's very important to remember is, you know, we're not trying to domesticate the Arabic language. We're trying to take something from the Arabic literary heritage and make it accessible to an English language readership. We cannot completely alienate that readership. We have to bring them in. And sometimes we have to make very difficult choices. We, we, I'm sure there's no consensus yet in this no. group that we are translating the names because we've only looked at one. Richard has not yet told us no. how he feels about all the names that appear and whether, because we won't be able to translate some but not translate others because what would be our translation principle then? What would we say? How would we explain our, our, our method? Uh, we've translated the ones that we thought were easy to translate and the other ones, well, <laughs> we decided not to do anything with it, right? I mean, and it's very important. And the other thing to, to, to bear in mind, I think it's important to, to convey, one of the things that the Library of Arabic Literature Editorial Board decided is that, and actually I should quote Humphrey Davis, who's translating the Saq al-Saq. He was asked once, in, he was asked in, a, in an interview, uh, uh, we've heard that the poetry of Mutanabbi is untranslatable. And his response was, that's absurd. There are only two positions. Either everything is untranslatable or everything is translatable. Right? And, and so the Library of Arabic Literature Board is of the opinion that if we can bring our minds together and come up with something that we think we can at least defend, not, not proselytize with and say, this is how you have to do it, but defend. This is our method. This is how such and such a person has come up with this. Some, an editor translator may come to us and say, I've decided to do it this way. We may scratch our heads. And they'll say, here's why. And we say, OK, if, if, if that's what you think, that's how you think you're going to do it, and you explain it, then fine. Right? So this is, it's very important that you understand this is not, uh, you know, we're not trying to impose anything on anyone. We're trying to find a way. And, and you've just pointed out exactly the problem that we have. We all know what Qurta line means. Michael can tell you where it comes from. Michael? Well, I <laughs> think I mentioned that at the beginning. <laughs> but it's from the Quran. Right? I mean, there are, things have origins. Things have histories. And they travel and they, and they get used in different ways. So, uh, any more questions? I mean, I could it's, add a quick footnote yeah. to that before we move on to the question here. Uh, it's not clear from our presentation here, but when the books come out, they have Arabic on one side and English on the other, right? Yeah. Which is not normal for translations. Normally, if you buy a translation into English from, say, Japanese, all you get is the English and you have to live with whatever it says. What we're doing here is, in effect, to emphasize that. Uh, well, to emphasize that it's a conversation and that it's tentative. The original is there. So all of the uh, critiques and observations that you are making, all the readers can make too, right? We don't hide behind an English text. We don't hide the original, right? So it's, in, in effect, we're making ourselves very vulnerable. Absolutely. Okay? We were. It's hard. It really is. Because all of you can see every single decision we've made. I'd like to throw you a curveball just before you move on because I'm not an Arabist, I have to say, but what strikes me as missing here is the sense of emotional appeal. I don't know what the power relationship is between uh, this person and a mullah, but uh, the, the whole tenor for me here is very confusing and without looking at the Arabic I came up very quickly with something that uh, would occur to me and it's um, something like uh, uh, wonder of my eye um, I beg you to forgive my error do not abandon me confound it you and I are of one soul without you I am dust now, this doesn't relate directly to the Arabic because uh, I don't know Arabic, but the sense of um, intimacy is missing in some of the register that you've chosen with these words. If you spurn me, how would I survive? It's more like a, a someone um, in a courtroom rather than in a um, relationship of sexual intimacy. Is this not what it was then, some kind of um, uh, relationship that was uh, perhaps oral even, not even written down? What do you think? Julia? I think that um, 
some of the choices that you've made would resonate differently with me from the way that they do with you. Talking about yourself as bust, for example, is something that I would find difficult unless I regarded myself not merely legally, but personally as somebody's slave. And I think that what struck us about this was that it was very simple and it was very dignified. And it was one person talking to another, not somebody in an inferior position talking to somebody who was really in a completely different sphere. Although there is, of course, the fear of being unilaterally abandoned, it's expressed, I think, in a very dignified way. And what strikes me is the fact that the Qadi, who uh, we know and will explain in a footnote, was uh, both a judge <coughs> and a legal scholar and a man of letters and widely cultivated and so on, felt that this poem was remarkable enough for it to be worth him transmitting. We don't know whether he felt it was remarkable only as poetry or whether he thought it was interesting historically as well. And that's one of the features that we always have to deal with in Arabic, which tends to say much, much less rather than to fill in all the bits that we would really like to know about. We have to try and guess them. So that is certainly an absolutely fundamental problem for us in all the kinds of things that we are trying to translate. We don't want to over-guess, but we want to leave for our readers the same kind of framework of uh, reasonable guesses that the original authors have left for their readers. My two fills worth uh, quickly on Qurat al Ain. Um, I think it bears translation simply because it's a nom de plume. In, in Urdu literature, for example, poets assume a tahallus, uh, a, a, mm -hmm. a name that they choose for themselves, a reflection of their character or their temperament or their thoughts. Uh, and, and it's chosen with great care. And in this case, it may very well be that uh, that, that, that was chosen for, for Qurat al Ain. My question to you is about the process. I work in government, and the uh, trend these days is for open government, open uh, policy development, and in the corporate world, open innovation. Um, so now, this is open translation. Is this something that you see will increase? Uh, and would it, quest would it therefore lead you to question that solitary translator working feverishly by candlelight uh, and, and her or his output. Can I can answer that. James? J Julia, sorry, Julia? Well, I was going to point out that this is not the first time that it has been done, and specifically for Arabic. Um, the American University in Cairo, uh, decades ago, had a very, I think, well-received series of translations from modern Arabic that were done as team efforts, and in particular, they were reviewed uh, by non-Arabists who were not actually in dialogue with the translators from the Arabic. They, they read them by themselves and tried to, as it were, recreate them. Um, now that is one way of doing it. Um, and I think the translations were very, very successful. But it was perhaps slightly easier for the reasons that uh, Chip <coughs> has outlined to us. There is not such a cultural break if you are among modern writers as if you are looking back into the past. Unfortunately, uh, I'm told that we have to wrap up, so you will not have the uh, pleasure of the uh, elegy that we um, translated. Uh, but for those of you who can stick around, we're happy to speak with you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we look forward to your support here in Abu Dhabi and uh, throughout the world. And, uh, and as we said, we are open. The, web, the Library of Arabic Literature website is public. There's a blog. There are ways of getting in touch with us. This is not a closed enterprise. Oh, we are not uh, beavering away, as I said, uh, in our little studies. We're trying to make this as open and as uh, interactive as possible. Uh, but once again, thank you very, very much.